Psalms chapter 8, verse 4 and 5. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Please have your seats. I hope this scripture will be an encouragement to you. You know, just the fact that God is mindful of each one of us. There's a story that I'd like to tell you today. And the story is found in the book of Judges. And Judges is an interesting time because as a, as a, as a, as a, as a book of Judges comes to an end, there's a portion of scripture here in, in Judges 21 and, and verse 25. It says that in those days, Israel had no king and everyone did as he saw fit. So, you know, it was every man for himself and God for us all. And so this was a season of anarchy, so to say. But uh, this last story, it just fascinates me about how God works. And, and, and let me tell you something, friends. I know sometimes you go through seasons in life where you try to figure God out. And let me just help you here. You cannot figure God out. You, you just can't. He is God. He is Jehovah. He is the creator of the universe. And he is more. He is bigger than our mind can fathom. So stop trying to figure God out. And so in this particular story that starts in chapter 19, of the book of Judges, chapter 19, we see this man. We are not even told his name. We're just told that uh, he's a Levite, and we are told where he lived. You know, he lived in the hill country of Ephraim. You know, a remote area out there. That's where this Levite lived. And we also know that he had a servant and a concubine. And this concubine was unfaithful. And so at one point, I think they either had a row or a disagreement, but she packed her bags and took off and went back to her father's house. And after four months, this Levite decided, you know what, I can't live without, uh, you know, my concubine, uh, of course, at this particular point, his wife. And so he packs his bags, him, his donkeys, and his servant, and he goes to Bethlehem of Judea. And when he gets there, he finds his father-in-law, and he's a pleasant man. He welcomes him in, and uh, they hang out together. And, and the Bible says in, in, in verse 5 that on the fourth day, they got up early in the morning, and he prepared to leave. You know, after he had negotiated with his concubine, and she had agreed to go back with him home. And on the fourth day, he wakes up in the morning, and he says, you know what, today I'm leaving. And so the father-in-law is, is not very happy. We can see that because he, he tricks him. He says, okay, that's fine, but before you go, let us eat together. They, they drank something together and they just hung out. And, and evening came and he says, no, 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 don't, give, don't leave uh, you know, when it's late at night. So please just spend one more night. Please spend one more night. And it went on like that for two days. And finally, the, this guy wakes up in the morning and they hung out and he had learned the old man that I want him to go. And in the afternoon, he saw the old man do his old trick again. You know, feed him, they drink here and there, and they're making merry. And when the old man started insisting, he said, no, even if it is evening, we still have to go. So they pack their bags and leave. And as they leave, uh, they proceed and uh, they go, and, and it's, it's in the evening, and, you know, and... Uh, they get to, to Jebus, you know, later on called uh, Jerusalem. And when they get there, the servant says, hey, it's almost evening, so why don't we spend the night here? And the Levite says, no, 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 no. We will not do that. We will proceed on until we get to a land where our people live. So this man is, uh, is patriotic. He, he loves his own because of the cultures there. And so they don't, get, they don't stop in Jebus and they move on. And by the time they get to Geber, it's, 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 you know, sundown. So they go, then the culture then was, uh, when you're a traveler and you get to the city, to a town, you stand at the, at the, at the town square and people can tell you're not from there. And, uh, you know, whoever would be willing, they would take you as a traveler into their house 
and you would spend the night there and then the following day you leave. And so this man stood there for some time and no one was, was welcoming him home. But an old man comes and uh, he, he comes and, and he's seeing this guy has been here for a while and he says, hey, hi, uh, what are you doing here? Where are you from and where are you going? And the old man, I mean, the, the Levite, looks at him and says, I've been here and no one has, uh, has invited me home. You can tell from the tone, he's a bit irritated. And I don't want anyone to give me any food. You know, we have our own water, we have our own food, we have our own bread. We don't need anything. We just need a place to crush our head. And the old man says, no, 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 it's okay. <clears throat> come, to my, come to my house. And they, so they proceed together to this man who also, you know, uh, is a Jew like him. And so they go and he's given a place to sleep. But that night something happens. You know, you remember the spirit of Sodom and Gomorrah. He never died with Sodom. So there were a few of those kind of people in Gibeah. And so these evil people show up at the old man's house and they want to break the door down. And they are insisting, give us the Levite. Give us the man. You know, these gay guys, they want to be given this man so, so that they can, you know, abuse him. And the old man says, no, 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 please <clears throat> don't do this evil thing. Hallelujah. So this man brings them in and they want to break down the door. And the old man is saying, please don't do this heinous act. Don't do it. But they insist and the old man realizes that they're going to break their door, his door. And so he says, look, I have a daughter here who, ha who is not married. And this man's concubine, we will throw them out to you. Just don't abuse or assault my visitor because I brought him into my house. He's under my protection. And so the Levite decides, I don't want to cause you problems. So he grabs his concubine and throws him out, throws her out. And so these people take the concubine and they abuse her through the night. And when it's just before sundown, Something happens, you know, they, I mean, they walk away and she staggers all the way back to the door of, of this old man's, man's house. She falls down at the door and uh, at the veranda. And so the Levite and his host, they open the door and they find the concubine who has been abused the whole night. So as they try to tap her and talk to her, she's unresponsive. So the Levite says his goodbyes takes the concubine, puts her on one of the donkeys, and then they travel all the way back to Ephraim, the hill country. When he gets there, he removes a knife and he cuts this concubine into 12 pieces. And he sends those 12 pieces to all the children of Israel. Wow. And when these human pieces arrive, these Israelites are appalled, but they are also angry. And they decide, no, 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 we can't let this one slide. But they need to find out what happened. So they gather, and the Bible says 400,000 men gathered. So these 400,000 men gather. And when they gather, the concub I mean, th this Levites, uh, who lives in the, in the hill country of Ephraim, he shows up and he, 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 these guys are asking, so what is all this? We have never seen anything like this among us or in Israel before. So tell us. And so he tells them, he narrates the story. When he's done, the elders of these 400,000 men, they gather together and say, good. Now this is what you're going to do. This happened in Geber. And the tribe of Israel that lives in Gibeah are the Benjamites. So they decide, call the elders of the Benjamites. And so they show up and they tell them, we want you to show us who did this heinous act. And when you show us who these guys are, we will deal with them so that we can purge evil out of Benjamin, out of Gibeah. The elders of Benjamin think and they decide, nah, there's nothing like this. We are not going to give up any of our men, regardless of what they did. 
So they come back and bring a report and they say, you know what? Vile munafanyaga mukikasirika mufanye. Whatever you do when you're angry, do it. <laughs> now, it's important for you to know this. In Gibeah, among the Benjamites, there are only 26,100 soldiers. But they have 700 of them. They have 700 of these Benjamites who we can call today Marines. You get what I'm saying? As in, these are guys who, in fact, let me read to you. Chapter 20 and verse 16, it says this. Among all these soldiers, there were 700 chosen men who were left-handed, each of whom could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. So they are the equivalent of the Marine. As in, these were guys who were on top of the game. Missing was not part of the equation. They just don't miss. No wonder the Benjamites had the audacity or the courage to tell 400,000 men to hell. Do whatever you think is bad. Do whatever you think you can do when you're angry. And of course, that aggravated these people. And so these 400,000 children of Israel, they decide, you know what? You will see us. And remember, just simple maths. 26 out of 400,000, it means that it is one soldier to 10. You know, 10 uh, to one Benjamite soldier. So of course these guys were confident, uh, we'll take these guys down. So they decided to divide themselves and they said, this is a group that will be in charge of uh, resources and, and, and feeding the army. And then the rest of us, armed with sword, spear and shield, we shall go and teach the Benjamites a lesson. And that's where I want us to look at today. So, in verse 17, in verse 18, the Israelites went up to Bethel and inquired of the Lord. Now, the ark of, the, the ark of, 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 of God was in Bethel those days. And Phinehas was the one who was, you know, serving at the ark of the of, 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 of God in Bethel. And so these people, the Israelites, they didn't just wake up one morning and decide to go to war. No, they actually went to seek God and ask him, should we fight our brothers, the Benjamites? And that's where we are at in verse 18. The Israelites went up to Bethel and inquired of God. They said, who of us shall go first to fight against the Benjamites? So they have prayed. They have sought God. Just like some of you, you know, you have prayed over certain issues. God, should I marry this man? God, should I go into this business? God, should I do this? Should I the other? And many of us Christians, you know, of the household of faith, on important issues, we seek the Lord. So they didn't just take the fact that we are 400,000 and we have outnumbered these guys 10 to 1. We just go out there and slaughter them they actually went to Bethel and sought God and asked him, should we go and fight our brothers, the Benjamites? This is the response that God gave. The Lord replied, Judah shall go first. Judah shall go first. So the following morning, armed to their teeth, they got to the fields of Geber. And the Benjamites came out, of course, even them ready for battle. Remember, they have 700 left-handed Marines, so to say, who just don't miss. But these guys are, no, ah, we have 400,000 men. So they showed up. The Lord is amazing. Remember, he's the one who said, Judah shall go first. That day, verse 21, the Bible says that the Benjamites came out of Geber and cut down 22,000 Israelites on the battle that day. They went to Bethel. They asked God, should we go? And the Lord said, Judah should go first. Specific instructions. And they obey. Yet, that day, they had fatalities to the tune of 22,000 men were cut that day. 
and died. There is no record of the Benjamites losing a soul. So these men in the evening, they go back and, you know, they count their numbers and they are shocked that 22,000 men have died. So the following day, they go and cry. The Bible says that they cried out to the Lord. In fact, it says in verse 22, but the men of Israel encouraged one another and again took up their positions and they had the, the positions where they had stationed themselves the first day. The Israelites went up and wept before the Lord until evening. They cried before God. And I'm sure at this particular point, they're asking themselves, did we really hear from God? Who said that God said Judah should go first? And when they went around, they realized it's true. God had said we should go, we should fight. And even more specifically that Judah should go first. Then how come we have lost 22,000 men in a day? So they wept and they cried the whole day until evening. And then they inquired of the Lord again. Shall we go up again to battle against the Benjamites, our brothers? This is the second response that God gives them. The Lord answered, go up against them. Second time, same answer. Go up against them. So the second day, they got to the road. They got to Gibeah. And they said, Tokeni, armed to their teeth. Now, the Benjamites show up with their marine, left-handed marines who don't, who don't miss. And that day, the Israelites had more, they had casualties again. 18,000 men armed with sword and spear. They were cut down and they died. The Israelites lost again 18,000 men. So at this particular point, they have lost 40,000 men, 40,000 soldiers. Man, the casualties are high. They have amazing losses. And they are wondering, because they came 400,000. Now they are down to 300,000, 360,000 men left. And friends, sometimes that's how we go through life. You go and ask God, God, I thought you told me to go. God, I thought you are the one who said yes here. God, I thought I had right. You even have a scripture that you hold on to. You know, Meshika Neno, a prophecy that you ran with. And you are sure beyond reasonable doubt that God said, go. Even more specifically, let Judah go first. Maybe even God gave you a name in terms of that spouse that you need to marry, that God gave you a specific name. Maybe that's exactly where you are. <clears throat> you are sure that God is the one who spoke to you. You are sure, even sometimes even a name, maybe it's a spouse. God even gave you a specific name and told you, this is a woman or the man you should marry. You are sure beyond reasonable doubt. You are positive that you heard the voice of God. Maybe even it's a prophecy. You're holding on to it. You have that verse and you prayed and stood upon it and you are sure that God spoke to you. Maybe God sent you to preach somewhere. God sent you as a missionary or as a pastor. But you know, the mud has hit the fan and you're wondering, God, is it you who sent me here? Maybe it's business. Things are not working out. You're almost being auctioned or you've just been auctioned once or twice. And you're wondering, God, did I really hear from you? And now you are doubting that confidence that you had before, that God had spoken to you. And I'm sure this is what the Israelites were going through at this particular point in their life. Remember, they went to Bethel. They didn't just pray in the field. I'm sure God would still have heard them. But they actually took time to go all the way to Bethel to pray by the Ark of the Covenant where the presence of God lingered. The presence of God was there by the Ark. And so they went up there all the way and they sought the Lord, 400,000 men. 
They didn't just take the fact that, you know what, we are 400,000. We have outnumbered these guys 10 to 1. They didn't, they were not operating on the bare confidence of their numbers. But they were humble enough to go to Bethel and ask God, is it you? Should we go? And the Lord says, go, and Judah should go first. They lose 22,000 men. 22,000 fatalities of war that day. The following day, they go and cry. And the Bible says that they cried the entire day until evening. They cried and wept before the Lord. And they asked God again. Hallelujah. They asked God again. <clears throat> Verse 23. In fact, allow me to read it to you. Verse 23. The Israelites went up and wept before the Lord until evening. And they inquired of the Lord. They said... Shall we go up to fight against the Benjamites, our brothers? And even here, you know, that simple words that say, again. Why? Because they had gone before. And so they're saying, shall we go again? And, and even you, you've already been auctioned. And you're asking God, should I go again? Should I do this again? Should I walk this road again? You have done this exam, you have failed. You have done it again, you have failed. And you're asking God, I, God, did you call me to do accounts? Did you call me to do medicine? Did you call me to do engineering? Did you call me to do this course? Because I have failed once. God, should I do it again? And then God says, yes. He even gives you signs that confirms that he has called you to do accounts or medicine again. And now you go in again and you still fail a second time and you're wondering, God, if it is you, then why am I failing? Why am I being auctioned? Why am I being, you know, why, why are things not working out? And I'm sure it is extremely and absolutely frustrating. No wonder this man cried. You know, in verse 23, he said, they went up and wept before the Lord until evening. The entire day, this man just cried before the Lord. And a second time, the first time, he says yes, 22,000. A second time, he says yes, 18,000. 20,000 men, 40,000 men down. Now they go to God a third time. A third time. But there's something different this third time. Something different. After the 18,000, the Lord doesn't speak to them. It is they who decide this time around, we will not just pray. But this time around, we'll pray, we will fast, and we shall bring an offering. So this time around, it's different. So what do they do? They wept until evening, but this time around, they fasted. They didn't eat or drink. In fact, in verse 26, the Bible says, <clears throat> Then the Israelites, all the people went up to Bethel, and there they sat weeping before the Lord. They fasted that day until evening and presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings to the Lord in Bethel, Bonasphere. They went up. They cried the whole day. They prayed, they fasted, and they brought offerings, a sacrifice. Verse 27, the Bible says, And the Israelites inquired of the Lord in those days. The ark of the covenant of God was there, with Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, ministering before it. They asked, Shall we go up again? to battle with the Benjamites, be Benjamite, our brother or not. Now, doubt has come in. Now they are saying, should we go or not? Before they were just asking, should we go? But now there are 40,000 men down. And now they are saying, just a minute. Should we go or not? But what's the difference here? Previously, they just prayed the whole day. But this time around, they pray, they fast. They bring a sacrificial offering. So here, listen to the response God tells them. The Lord responded, go, for tomorrow I will give them into your hands. Go, for tomorrow 
I will give them to your hands. So the following day comes and they go, kama kawaida, to Gibeah. And uh, they set out for battle. But this time around, God gives them an idea of this battle. And so what happens? The Benjamites come out confident like the last two times. And as they show up, the battle begins. I don't know how they started the battles in those days. I don't know whether everyone lined up on their side and then they counted one, two, three. Oh yeah! I don't know how they did it. But anyway, the battle began. And this time round, things didn't go as the Benjamites had planned. But at face value, they looked like they were winning. They came out and they started slaying the Israelites, their fellow Israelites. And 30 of them fell by the road. Now, the Benjamites are chasing after the Israelites. And the Israelites are running as fast as they can to get out of there, down the road. And the Benjamites are saying, ah, these guys are cowards. Let's run after them and annihilate all of them. You know, super confident. They run after them. And as they are running, they actually slay 30 men who fall dead on the road. But then, a few miles out, they, the other Israelites, the other tribes, they had flanks on the side of the road. And so they come down and now attack the Benjamites. But also, others had gone all the way around. They had gone all the way around into the Benjamite country, into the town, and they killed everyone alive there. And they set the Benjamite houses on fire. So now the Benjamites are surrounded. And when they look back, they see their homes and their town going up in smoke. Now, they were not just scared, but now they were frightened. And that day, 25,000 men were cut down and they died. The battle was serious. This was a serious battle. In fact, the record shows that only 600 men escaped. Only 600 men escaped. Only. You know, in this story, I have a few questions myself. And I kept wondering, God, these people came to seek you. They took time to ask you. Why didn't you reveal to them? Why would you allow them to go the first time 22,000 men die? Why would you say go and then 18,000 men die? And even the last time they came back to God. And now even doubt has checked in. Where now they're asking, should we go to fight our brothers or not. And at that particular point, when I got to that particular point, in my head, I was feeling, maybe God was saying, why would you want to fight your, your brothers? And maybe that's why God is giving them over. But as I read on that story, I started realizing that, you know what? Eh? There are things you pray about, but there are things you fast and pray about. I don't know what situation you are in, my brother or my sister. I don't know if you have been crying and praying. But maybe it's time for you to learn some lessons from this story. Where there comes a time where you don't just cry and pray. There comes a time where you fast and pray. Where the mud hits the fan. Where you fold your sleeves and go to battle spiritually. Because the issue here, the battle was not just in the physical. It had to be won even in the spiritual. And that's why they were fasting. Because fasting is a spiritual battle. So they won this battle in the spirit first. And scripture reminds us that whatever is bound here on earth will be bound in heaven. So they won the battle in the spirit first, the day they declared a fast. And they brought offerings to the Lord. Because the truth is, friends, you don't, the Bible says, you don't go to God empty-handed. You don't just show up before the Lord empty-handed. And so here, they fulfilled the purposes of God. So it is incumbent of you. My people perish for lack of knowledge because you don't know. Here, earlier, the two times before, 
It's because they don't know. Or they were walking in ignorance. They were just, they just showed up to battle. And God says, you go. But you know the word here says, you don't show up before God empty-handed. And number two, the battle has to be won first in the spiritual realm. And so when it is won here, it will be manifested in the physical. And for sure, this is evidence. And let me tell you something. When the battle rages and it has been won in the spirit first, it shall surely be established in the physical. And that's in Matthew chapter 18. And so I challenge you, before you go to battle in the physical, make sure that you have won that battle in the spiritual realm first. So that when you go to battle, it just be an establishment of that which has already been done in the spirit. So they fasted. Things you fast about, but there are things you just pray about. This one, this one, you don't just pray, but you pray and fast. And for sure, the battle was sure. Even the response was different. In this particular instance, the Bible says in verse 28, the last part, the Lord responded, go, for tomorrow I will give them into your hands. Go, for tomorrow there is assurance. Previously, he just said, go. See, that's what you want. <clears throat> you just want to go. You're Russia. So you just want to do a business. Or do you want to do a business and succeed? Do you want a marriage? That, you know, <laughs> my people perish for lack of knowledge. Hosea 4, 6. Even the response from God is different. And here it says, the Lord responded, go, for tomorrow I will give them into your hands. Previously, in verse 23, he just said, go up against them. No guarantees. No guarantees at all. Verse 18, Judah shall go first. Go, and let Judah go first. But after they prayed again, cried and wept, fasted the whole day. They did not eat or drink. And they brought sacrifices. Why? Because you don't just show up to God empty-handed. And the battle is won in the spiritual fast. Because this is a spiritual world. And if you think I'm joking, look around. Buddha, Demand sacrifice. Islam, the same. But I want to remind you that Jehovah is God alone. And you don't just show up because he is God. Hallelujah. He is God. You know, friends, it is sad because it is not God who told them what to do. They knew it within themselves, what to do. They just took it for granted. If they had fasted and prayed and brought offerings, the first time they went to Bethel, in verse 18, they would have had no casualties. But 22 died, and then 18. And that's when they got back and said, hey, 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 let's evaluate. What are we doing? What are we doing? What does God require of us? God didn't tell them. They knew it all along. They just didn't do it. It's until they got to this place that they did what was right. Friends, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. God has you on the palm of his hand. And maybe you sit there asking yourself, who am I that God would be mindful of me? God desires that you be victorious. The Bible says that he will lay a table before your enemies. And that scripture is true. Because he's mindful of you. He is 
mindful of you. He loves you and he cares for you. So stop trying to figure out God. Just do that which you know is right. James 4, 17, if you know the good you ought to do and you do it not, you sin. So Mungu to say here, may the Lord help us. Because inertly, we know exactly what to do. And in this particular situation, they knew exactly what to do. Because they were in the battlefield. They didn't go back home, no. It is among the food they had there that they presented as offerings. And they decided we shall fast and pray. So they knew where the power was. They just hadn't used it yet. And because they hadn't, 40,000 men, fathers, brothers, and sons died. There are 40,000 homes that lost a father. There are 40,000 homes that lost a son. There are 40,000 women who are widowed. There are fought hundreds, maybe 100,000 or so, children or more who became fatherless. Did the widows, I mean, did the women become widows because God doesn't care? No, God cares. It is these people who did not fulfill that which was required of them. Hosea 4, 6. You see, ignorance is not bliss. May the Lord Almighty help us. May the Lord Almighty have mercy on us. So that which you know is true. That which you know is right and you know it in your heart. Do it. Do it. You don't have to wait until you are at that particular point where you can no longer afford any losses. That you do that which you know you should do. Do it fast. Why? Because God is mindful of you. God loves you. God's desire is that you should not perish. His plans is not for you to perish. It's for you to succeed. But you have to succeed in line of his word. Don't be a casualty of your own ignorance. May the Lord have mercy on us. Go back and read that story for yourself. Amazingly, you might see things that I missed. But at this particular point, I hope, I hope that you will yield to the leading of his word. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll allow me at this particular point, I'd like to pray. To pray for you. To yield. To yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit. To yield, to submit, to do that which you know is right. Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, there's a huge cloud of witnesses that is watching to see how our lives will pan out. And I pray that we shall walk in live in obedience with your word, being led and directed by your Holy Spirit, and where possible through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that we may live a life of victory, that many will be inspired to follow after our God, because our God is a good God, is a mighty warrior. O oh God, the Lord of hosts, help us, almighty God, and forgive us for the times that we have known what is right and, do not, and did not do it. I pray, almighty God, that you will help us and minister to us and through us, almighty God. Forgive us, Lord, and give us a second chance. And I pray that once we have yielded, once we have remembered, that the battle has to be won in the spirit first, in the spiritual realm, so that it shall be established in the physical. Knowing that you do not go outside your word. Father, may you help us. And I know sometimes we are so beaten that we fall down and give up. I pray that you will help us rise up because a righteous man falls seven times. He wakes up, dusts himself, and moves on. I pray that will be our story, that we shall never give up. We shall never give up. We shall never give up. But know that God is mindful of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Be encouraged. The Lord is in your side. And remember, the answers are already in you. You just need to seek. You don't have to wait until you are the, at the end, between a rock and a hard place, to do what is right. Do it now. Do it now.